calling what? The calling oh, I see. All right, we'll start at current slide. We are now recording, and here's where we pick up today. I do have a couple of announcements to make, and you'll probably hear these for the rest of the term, or at least some of these. The first of which is out of 13 students in this class, lucky 13, going to channel 13 maybe, hopefully, only one UNO paper has come in, research paper. So we only have two more weekends. All right, it's, uh, you got this week and next week, and that's all. I think the Tuesday of the following week, two weeks from today, is the final exam day. I believe that's right. Okay, that'll be good. Because Thursday's the last day to get that extra, that last little bonus point. Okay? Because next week there's zero bonus points, and then once finals start, you start losing points. Negative, non bonus points. Okay, so that's that. I've returned all your lab ones to you because everybody turned that in. Test one, everybody turned that in. I've returned that to you. Lab two, I'm still missing one lab two. Okay. Uh, test two, I've gotten all those back to you. Lab three, I've only gotten three in so far. Hopefully, y'all have are working on your moon lab. Get those in to me because I've only got three out of 13 in. Test three, we're missing two people. Have I taken that? I uh, think you did. I'm going to make sure I've got all the kids. Yeah, I'm yeah, you took them. test three. Two people haven't taken test three, neither of which are here now. Lab four, there's two different people haven't turned that in. Uh, test four, I think I returned to everybody. Lab five, uh, less than half of you have turned that in. Test five, all but one. And he's not here. Lab six, only I think four people have a turn in lab six. Test six, the take home test, I still have two people who have a turn that in. Lab seven, there's about four people who have a turn in lab seven. And test seven, uh, one, two, three, four, five people have it done test seven. Maybe six. What's that? Yeah. Okay, I grade for all the labs except for three, and I grade for all of the tests now. Good. Okay, great. So I got that correct. Thank you. Okay, so please, folks, don't get. Okay, now here's another situation that we have. If things are moving along as nicely as they've been moving now, and we get everything done, we might have an extra half a class or something like that to work on making up tests or labs. Now don't count on it, but there may turn out being that. Uh, let's see how things go with chapter uh, 23 today, and hopefully I'll hear back from Jerry Tracy tomorrow. I'm going to try calling him again tomorrow. I called him once, I had planned to call a second time, and I ran into an email that took basically an hour to do all the research and, and, and work out the details uh, to answer the questions that were on that one email. So it kind of ruined my end of the day yesterday. Uh, don't have any office hours to speak of today, 30 minutes at the end of the day, but I'm over on the Birmingham West Camp, East Campus then. Uh, and then on uh, tomorrow I've got you know four hours of office hours that I hope to get things caught up. All right, and, but then I've got to be doing my planning hearing stuff, so there's just tons of stuff to do, it seems like, every day. All right, any questions on anything up till now? There is one other announcement I wanted to make today, especially today, and I wish more people were here, but hopefully, I don't know if you'll hear this before the day is over. Anyone know what today is? One of the election days. This is the day for the runoff election. I'm not old enough to vote. Really? Yes. Oh, well, as soon, I am. As, soon I am. as you get on the I start 18 Sunday. All right, get registered. Get registered. And actually, believe it or not, you could have voted in the primary. If you were going to be turning 18.
2018 before the general election, they would have elected votes in Ohio. But they probably didn't know that. It's too late to get registered now. But get registered next week if you're a birthday Sunday. Congratulations, happy birthday. Um, but then next week, as soon as you can, get registered and then plan to vote in November. Please plan to vote. It's, I, I have the saying, if you don't vote, you have no right to gripe. And I like to gripe, so I want to have the opportunity to gripe. And uh, you just don't have a right if you don't vote. Okay? Now, my wife read this to me off the Internet. I saw the numbers. In the last general election, the presidential election in 2016, 65 million people voted for the leading candidate. 62 million people voted for the number two candidate. 90 million eligible voters did not vote. That is not a democracy, folks. That is a bare plurality. Not even, yeah, not even that really, but it's awful. I mean, and in these elections like this uh, runoff today, they'll be lucky to get 25% of the people to vote. That means 13% of the pop, of the eligible voters may decide who are candidates are. 13%. Is that a democracy? No. It's just who's got the, the dedicated people to get out there. So please vote. Yeah, and I, I mean, they're, 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 that's one thing. I, I may have missed a couple of minor elections somewhere along the way, but I've tried my best to vote every chance. I've missed one election, and yeah. that's because I was in the hospital. Yeah. I had surgery for my Yeah. So, Exactly. So please, folks, vote. I'm going to. Uh, my class is over at 5:30. My office hours are over at six. As soon as I can get out of the building and head toward the voting booth, that's where I'm going today. Uh, I just was running too short this morning to try to try to to try to make it this morning. All right. Uh, before you came in, guy, I was just talking about. I've only gotten one research paper in out of the 13 people in this class, only UNO one. So please try to get those in. And then there's uh, labs and tests, uh, returned several. This class is as good as any class I've ever had at getting the labs and tests in. I've already turned lab one, test one, test two, and test four. Uh, but the, the rest of them have at least one person missing either a lab or a test. Most of them are two or three or five or something. All right. Now, the one other thing, I'm just sort of celebrating this one today. Did y'all read the news story? My wife read it to me off the Internet. I think it was on Facebook or somewhere. That a Lawson student got a new job that started over the weekend and his car broke down the night before he was to start work. So he went to bed early that night, slept four hours, got up at midnight and started walking from Homewood, Alabama to Pelham, Alabama. And he started walking at midnight and in two hours had made it to Hoover and somewhere outside of Hoover getting close to Pelham or somewhere, a police car stopped him and asked if everything was all right. He said yes, and he explained the situation. They offered him a ride, took him to Whataburger, bought him a meal. They bought him the meal. They were so impressed by his work ethic, and took him to a church because he thought that would be the safest place for him to be at that time of night. So they uh, went on back to the station because it was right at shift change. They told the people they were relief, that were relieving them about this encounter. So the first thing those people did, they went to the church and then started trying to find him. He had already left the church and was walking to Pelham. And they picked him up, the second group of police officers, and I think took him for another breakfast or something, I don't know what, uh, but then took him to the woman's house. It was a moving company he had just started working for. Hadn't even reported to work yet. I get already been done all the paperwork, but hadn't done the first job yet. He, they took him to her address, knocked on her door, it was like 
5.30 in the morning. They were up. They could see lights on and stuff. And she and her husband were already boxing things, putting things in box, getting ready for the moving company. And they told her the story. <laughs> she was so impressed. And she invited him in and said, look, you can go upstairs and grab a nap if you want to. He said, no, 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 I got four hours sleep before I started, so I can help you with your boxing. So he helped her get ready for, she and her husband, get ready for the uh, move. And then the movers showed up, and she said to them, she said, tell them what you did. He said, well, I walked here. And that's all he said. She said, no, tell them the rest of it. And so she forced them to tell them, and they were really impressed. And sometime that morning, or sometime during the day, she posted it on social media. It made its way, and because she included the company's name, made its way to the press of the company up in Nashville, Tennessee. He drove down to Birmingham in a 1914 car that he had, that he had never put many miles on, came to Birmingham, to greet the guy and to thank him for, you know, the dedication, the work ethic and stuff, and gave him the car. And and guess what? The guy's response was, seriously? <laughs> that was the only thing he could say. And uh, it made the news, and I think Miss Duncan, uh, a student, former student of hers, had posted because he was somewhere in a picture with it. And uh, she read that, and then at the very bottom, at the very end, all it said was local college student, blah, blah, blah. At the very bottom, it said a Lawson State student. And I was telling that to my class this morning, and a student said it right back there. said, that was, that was a Lawson State student? Yeah, I heard that. You know, so she didn't even know it was Lawson State, you know. Uh, so anyway, that was really exciting news to hear. So probably going to make its way around, so you probably will hear it sometime. That's a dedication. Yeah, it really was. He did not want to lose that job opportunity. He wanted to be on time for that first job. Wow. Uh, and then, wow, and thank you for the police and everybody else that you know, were so understanding. I mean, they could have been very negative. That's happened all over the U.S. recently. Yay area. Way to go. Show them how it's done. All right, enough of that. Any questions on anything we've done so far? Uh, before you came in, I was saying I tried to contact Jerry Tracy yesterday, couldn't get him. Had planned to call back toward the end of the day when I knew he would probably be in the uh, office, uh, but I got bogged down with a email request that took an awful lot of time to research and then to figure out an answer to and to respond to. <clears throat> By the time I was through with all that, I was an hour late getting home, so I didn't get to call him back, and he was probably busy with the newscast right there. So anyway, I'll try again tomorrow. In fact, I may try again today because I was telling uh, Cassidy or, or everybody who was here earlier that uh, we are making great progress, mostly because we didn't get to go to the planetarium. That loss is, that was basically an all-day affair. I mean, not all day, but you know, all the class period of time. Uh, so we, we've gotten a little bit ahead. So if we finish the chapter today, we've only got, we've got Thursday, Tuesday, and Thursday of next week. And I'm pretty sure, hopefully we'll be at Channel 13 one of those days. So I think in the other two days we can get Chapter 24 done. Uh, so we'll, we may actually, what I was telling her, we may finish a little early today. Uh, if we get to a good stopping point, just because we're we're making good progress, okay. So, and that may give us. In fact, maybe it's better to go on and take the time today, and then if we have some time in the remaining days, have that be a makeup day for labs and tests for anyone who needs to make those up. So we'll see. We'll figure it out. So let's talk about hurricanes <clears throat> now. I'm hoping the next slide, let me just look ahead. Nah. Let me get it. Basically what our hurricane is, and we started talking about this, this is an area of low pressure, tropical depression, 
it, they start, they all start in the tropics. Remember what the tropics were? 23 and a half degrees south to 23 and a half degrees north of the equator. Approximately. That's basically what we call the tropics. Between the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer, where, where those are. Okay? Now, around the equator, most direct solar radiation hit the Earth's surface all the time, year round. Most direct, top, you know, and that solar radiation eats the waters, because most of the equator is surrounded by water. There's a little bit of Africa, a little bit of South America, and a little bit of Asia. You know, that's all that crosses the equator. Most of it is water. Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, uh, most of it's water. So the, the uh, that direct radiation hits those areas, and there the water is uh, evaporated, the air is heated, it all lifts, creating low pressure in the equator. All that lift is going on, especially in the hottest most direct part of the summer, okay, in the northern hemisphere, that's when it happens the most, and the greatest heat, you know, greatest energy is going in there, so you have this evaporation, low pressure, and that movement upward, and you get any kind of situation where you get some crosswinds and stuff, and you start circulation. Remember, uh, Coriolis force, the spinning of the earth, and the rising, that creates circulation. That is your tropical depression, area of low pressure. The winds are usually generally moving around 55 kilometers per hour or less, which would be about 35 to 40 miles per hour. Not a huge wind. I mean, stiff, but not a huge wind. But if that builds and continues to heat, and continues to spin and continues the upward mobility, okay, and the pressure gets even less, it can develop into a tropical storm. More intense low pressure area, I wish they gave the pressures here too, but they don't. The winds are now between that you know, 35 to 40 miles per hour up to about 72 miles per hour, okay? That's getting into some pretty serious wind, okay? That's your tropical storm. If that continues to grow and to build and to get stronger and stronger, you get a very intense low pressure, and that's in the eye. The winds are now are in excess of 72, 75 miles per hour. You have a fully developed hurricane, has a calm eye, that's the, sur the surprising part, surrounded by intense rain and thunderstorms. But in the eye, it's perfect. No rain, no wind, no anything except very low pressure. Okay. Now, Pius is here. First part of the alphabet is beginning to do better. Uh, and by the way, I was mentioning to the others before you came in, only one paper, research paper, has come in out of 13 students, and there's still several students who are either missing a test one or more tests or one or more labs. I've returned several tests and several labs to you, or at least one lab to you, and still waiting on the others. Oh, all right, here comes one. Here comes another. <laughs> hey, good deal. Thank you so much. All right. Good. And here is Gregory, right? All right. So, uh, and this is how you measure the hurricanes, the amount of that low pressure. That is really as important, of course, they're directly related to each other, as the wind speed. The lower the pressure, the greater the wind speed. Okay? Now, that calm eye is a bizarre thing. Okay? Um, I had a friend when I was in grad school at the University of Georgia. He was an undergrad. His major was forestry at the time. Nice guy, sharp guy, uh, but when he, his father actually was a pilot, I think for either Eastern or Delta, I don't remember which. It seems like he started off being Eastern and then he moved to Delta and Eastern folded. But anyway, he was a pilot, and Doug had not really wanted to follow in his 
father's footsteps. He wanted to be outside, you know, be a forester. But once he graduated, and I think as he moved on up into college, you know, and stuff, he got the flying bug bit him. He decided he wanted to fly too. So he, I think his father had already taught him to fly, and uh, so he was fairly well set for it. The trouble was the airlines were consolidating and closing and deregulating and all this kind of stuff, and there just weren't many flying jobs out there because all the people getting laid off were looking for the various jobs that were available. So uh, like his dad had to go from Eastern to Delta, like I said. So Doug, when he got qualified and everything, he couldn't find the job right off the bat. So he went to work for NOAA. Does anyone know what NOAA is? National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association, or something like that. Administrator, administrator. N A N O A A, NOAA. And he got a job as a hurricane pilot. And what he would do, he would fly the research, the, the aircraft that took all the measurements and stuff, fly way over the high part of. The, the rough part of the hurricane and then drop down into the eye and there they would take all their measurements and stuff and then fly back up and out. I'm sure it was really rough, even way up there above all that storm, but in the eye it was calm as it could be. And they'd fly around in there uh, as long as they had you know, fuel and, and could collect data and got all the things they needed and then they circle up, fly out, head on. So uh, it's uh, incredible that eye. The calm eye is surrounded by intense rain, okay, and incredible thunderstorms. In fact, the pictures you see of it, you're in that calm eye and you see the winds just rushing by like crazy all around you, you know, but you're just perfectly calm. I mean, incredibly calm, okay. And here is a picture of one, and I don't remember which one this is. Um, seems like this may have been Andrew or one of the other smaller ones. But you see, here is the eye right here, okay? There is the eye of the, the hurricane, and it's perfectly calm in there. Whereas the walls of the eye are the most intense. I mean, it's just furious, you know, the, the, the wind and the... Uh, Stuff there. Notice here, this is a north northern hemisphere hurricane. You can tell that by the flow is counterclockwise. All low pressure areas in the northern hemisphere, the flow is counterclockwise. Okay? Now, as this storm is approaching, and you'll probably hear this anytime there is one, if the storm, and this is generally the direction of motion, is either toward the west or toward the northwest most of the time, sometimes due north. But wherever it's heading, the worst part of the storm is the part nearest the eye in the, to the right of the direction because the winds are turning this way and the storm is moving that way. Whereas on the back side, the storm's moving this way, but the wind's moving this way, so they sort of counter each other and reduce the ferocity of the wind. So uh, you'll all often hear them talk about, well, we're on the best side, or we're on the wrong side of the eye uh, where it's going to hit. Uh, I'm pretty sure Katrina, when it hit New Orleans, it hit just about like this, okay? And it was tragic, okay? Rita later that same summer, was it Houston it hit, or Galveston, or wherever it did, uh, whoever got on that side absolutely devastated, but the other side probably had it bad, but not as bad as that side. Um, back, I don't know how many years ago, Ivan hit um, Gulf Shores, basically, that area, and uh, the eastern side of that, because it was coming almost due north, the eastern side of that, I mean, it was tragic time. I think probably Florida got it worse than we did, but Gulf Shores got it pretty bad, too. Um, and what happened on the back side, the wind's going this way, the areas around Mobile 
and stuff, the bay and those kind of areas, they actually lost part of it. There's storm surge on this side and the storm retreat on that side. And actually a lot of their estuaries and other areas got washed out. And the shrimping industry depends on those estuaries. And we were down there a year or two after my wife's family used to like to go to the beach about every other two or three years or something like that. We were down a few years after Ivan and uh, and my father-in-law had gone to get shrimp somewhere. He said, well, how badly did Ivan in fact, uh, affect you? He said, well, yeah, it wiped it out that season. There was hardly any shrimp at all. But he said it was good. It has to happen because otherwise the water gets too stagnant and stank and polluted and, and it's just not a good habitat for the shrimp. It needs to be fleshed out every few years and now it's coming back to great guts. And that's how things do, you know. Nature knows what it's doing, okay. Now, and this is something I heard Jerry Tracy say, actually it was at our, at our church, he was, we were in the same book study type group, I uh, only went one time, I don't know if he went back anymore or not, but uh, someone there had just been commenting on, uh, well, I don't know why God allows hurricanes to happen. They just sort of create such devastation. Well, unfortunately for her, Jerry Tracy was <laughs> the group. He said, well, it just happens to be that if we didn't have hurricanes, we probably wouldn't have very comfortable life on this planet because all that radiation would be saturated on the, on the equatorial areas and they would get so miserably hot it would be hard for anything to grow and grow well there, and the rest of us would get so incredibly cold. He said hurricanes are nature's way of taking the heat from the equatorial areas and moving it up into the temperate areas, sort of balancing the, the heat scale. He said without it, we would not be a very inhabitable planet, or it would be really rough conditions. So yeah, they have a purpose. And like in everything, uh, usually my nature knows best. Okay. Now, here's a picture of what's happening then. Uh, now, if you recall back on the earlier slides when we talked about thunderstorms, you actually have some thunderstorms that actually get up here around 15 kilometers high. This is pretty high. <clears throat> but what it is, this is a cutaway view. This is all the way around, you know, and these can cover enormous areas. Go back to this slide. Uh, I don't know for sure, but that can cover probably more than the state of Rhode Island. <laughs> okay, a tornado is going to hit a town, you know, a hurricane is going to cover enormous areas. Okay, so these are huge. Okay, so this is covering a huge area here. And what's happening here, remember it's a low pressure area, and what's happening, the heat from the uh, environment is moving up, that causes the updrafts, carrying the moisture with it, and the movement upward, especially the rapids, the greater the pressure difference here, the faster these movements are, and the faster those are with the Coriolis force, you get the spin going, and that's where the, the high wind speed, so it all comes from the pressure, okay? So the eye has very low pressure, but no wind to speak of. Some downdraft in the middle here, but that's about it. The hurricane winds are in this band here. And it goes all the way around. It's sort of a donut-like thing here. And uh, the maximum winds are those closest to the wall, okay? Then the hurricane winds will extend out to there, and then beyond that, you get what they call the gale force winds. They can still do an awful lot of damage. Now, when Hurricane Ivan hit the Gulf of Mexico, it hit the Gulf Shores area, and came up, it came up right toward Birmingham, and by the time it got to Birmingham, it was still a tropical storm stream. Okay, it had diminished a little bit. Usually when they hit land, they lose ground pretty fast, but it was a pretty powerful storm, not nearly as powerful as as uh, 
uh, Andrew and uh, Katrina and Rita and some of those, but it was still awfully strong. Boy, what was it? Last year we had what, three Category 5 storms. Maria, um, goodness, I can't remember the other two. That was almost a new record. The year of Katrina, I think, was the most named storm we ever had. They went up all the way through the alphabet. You know, they start off, and in the old days, uh, the hurricanes were all named after the women's, women's names. And I think the story I heard, whether there's any truth to it, I'm not sure, the hurricane forecasters named them after their wives. But you know, I don't know if that was true or not. But that's why they got the women's name. But sometime during my lifetime, they went from being women to alternating men's and women's and alternating the who starts in the alphabet. Like it might be Albert one year and Alfredo the next, you know, starting, you know, so. But anyway, that year of Rita, of Katrina, Rita, and so on, they went all the way through the alphabet with name storms and started over and it's just named them A, A, B, B, C, C, G, D. So we had in the neighborhood of 30 storms that year. Named storms. They don't ever name it. I don't think they named depressions. They only named it once it's a tropical storm. And most years, we don't get to M. You know, that year we went all the way through the alphabet and started over again and just being named them A, A, B, B, C, C. Okay. Pretty powerful things. Now, next section here, oh, and by the way, and here I should go back to this one. I thought this was going to be on the slide. Here are the concepts applied here on hurricane damage. Okay, hurricanes are classified according to category and damage to be expected. Here is the classification scheme. Okay, category one hurricane, minimal hurricane. That's 120 to 153 kilometers per hour, which is 75 to 95 miles per hour. Now, on the opposite page, if you happen to have that page open, you'll see tornado damage. Tornado damage, a category zero tornado, starts at 75 miles per hour. So basically, a category zero tornado is equivalent to a category one hurricane. Okay, not exact, but pretty close. Uh, uh, difference is, tornadoes very, very small area, like uh, fifty to sixty feet to a mile wide. That's that's about all. Whereas hurricanes, <laughs> hundreds of miles. Okay, now the winds are all that strong for the whole thing, but it's just incredible. Okay. Um, so actually, I said that a little bit wrong. Category zero tornado is less than a uh, category one storm. Category one tornado and category one hurricane, uh, at least the lower part, are the same. 76 to 112 miles per hour for a tornado, 120, I'm sorry, 75 to 95 for a hurricane. So the upper part of a Category 1 tornado would be a Category 2 hurricane, 95 to 110, where in the tornadoes, it's, uh, that's the upper part of Category 1 uh, to, to 112, okay? Then Category 3, they call an extensive. Uh, that would be 111 miles per hour to 130 miles per hour. Uh, that gets in, that's a category three hurricane. That's basically a category two uh, tornado, and in fact, is the lower part of that. The upper, okay, the category four hurricane is 131 to 155 miles per hour wind. That is your upper part of category two tornado, okay? So category four, three and four covers two. One and two covers category one. Uh, one and two hurricane wind speeds are in category one tornado wind speed. Three and four wind speeds for hurricanes are in category three. Okay, I'm sorry, category two tornadoes. So there's a lot of 
A lot of difference there. But then a catastrophic hurricane, Category 5, is more than 250 kilometers per hour, 155 miles per hour, and that basically is a Category 3 tornado. But then they still have Category 4 and Category 5, so the tornado speeds can go up to more than twice, or awfully close to twice, more than twice the wind speed of a hurricane. But of course, a hurricane covers a much bigger area. There's a lot more total energy in a hurricane, a whole lot more, because it's so big. But the intensity of the storm where it hits is greater in a tornado, generally. Okay, so those are two tables that correspond to those. Uh, it's pretty interesting to, to compare. All right, now 23.3 is weather forecasting. I don't know if Jerry Tracer will appreciate all this, but it really is pretty fascinating. The ability to forecast weather, the ability to do it well, and everything depends on mathematical models of the atmosphere. And I don't know if you listen to Jerry Tracy or James Spann or some of the other meteorologists, quite often they'll say, well, according to one model, we could have rainfall tomorrow, but according to another one, it's probably going further south, you know. There are a variety of models out there that are trying to predict what the atmosphere is doing. Okay, here's the problem, folks. Just picture the U.S., okay? Pretty big country. Thousands of miles. I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of square miles, okay? And yet, we only have weather stations every here and there. The atmosphere is how many miles high? And we only have so much measurement we can do with this. They send up weather balloons, and they have instruments in them and they collect data and send them back radio signals back to the Earth again, and they receive those. They have aircraft fly, and they collect data. In fact, on many, say, commercial and military aircraft, they will collect data for the Weather Service and transmit those automatically to the Weather Service. So they do get a fair amount of input, but if you think about how big the atmosphere is, I mean, how deep it is, how wide it is, how... We only sample a little bit of space, okay? Just a tiny amount. Those weather balloons, I think they go up once or twice a day, and only in certain areas, and some others may only be two or three times a week in remote areas. I don't know, I mean, it's not a lot of data, and then they have to build the models on those data points. Well, guess what? It takes some time. Why time? Billions, billions of calculations are necessary to necessitate the use of supercomputers. Your little laptop's not going to do it, okay? A IBM system isn't going to do it. You're going to need supercomputers. There's one up in Huntsville, isn't there? McRae or something like that supercomputer up there that we use a lot at the two-year college system, I think all the educational uh, <coughs> facilities use that to speed things up. But the millions of calculations take a long time even on super fast computers. Okay? Now, here's the dig. I know that I enjoy looking at the seven-day outlook. Don't you? See what it's supposed to be next Sunday, you know? Guess what? Only about three days were really close to accurate. The others are good guesses, probably very good guesses, best they can do with what they've got, but really the fairly accurate forecast, only up to three days. They just don't have the data points, and the systems are so variable. Um, now, this is an extreme example, but it is true. You know, when the teams go up to climb Mount Everest or some of the other really tall mountains, it takes, it takes literally 
weeks to do that because you're going up to such high elevations you have to stop and let your body adjust for several days sometimes up to a week and sometimes there's two of those stops on the way up so and then it takes a long time to climb okay so you're talking about having to predict the weather up there well over a month in advance it's not possible especially in those extreme conditions anything could change and and just wreck all your plans and that happens uh, so many of the greatest of the mountain climbers have been caught by weather and killed okay only very few live to be old men and talk about it and write about it a lot of the a lot of them incredible numbers of them don't make it because it's impossible to accurately fairly accurately forecast more than about three days now the major uncertainty like i've been talking about insufficient technology to connect the small and large-scale events okay we only sample very small little areas time-wise and stuff and it's uh then you somehow have to have your models best guesses to how these react, react relate to each other ultimately the oceanic influences need to be better understood now this is a statement i've heard several times and i assume that it's true we know more about outer space than we know about our oceans and it's incredible to think about but it's almost easier for us to go into outer space and or send at least send up things and send back data and information from there than it is to go deep into the oceans that's a lot of pressure it's expensive i mean there's all sorts of things we don't understand the ocean that's the next chapter we'll talk about that even more so weather forecasting is no mean feat in fact it's pretty incredible that jerry tracy and james Spann and all the others can do as good a job as they do okay they've got a lot of data coming in a lot of different ideas very smart people contributing to it but it's still i hope we get to go to the weather station because it's it's really the whole station you know the newsroom and the weather they're right there right all in the same room uh but uh jerry will talk about that but the news i think the sports everything else is absolutely scripted the writers have written it the editors have edited it. everything is they reading a data a teleprompter that's all they're doing because they can get sued if they give too many opinions that aren't fact if uh, as long as they're covered by free except for the weather the weather is completely freelance okay jerry tracy is shooting from the hill okay he has the he sets up his weather forecast and the other weather people do too they decide what they're going to do the graphics they're going to show and all the other things but it's all their work and their ideas and guesses that's the only part of the newscast that is not strictly scripted all right that's the first i want to say half of the chapter that's the topics for the first half of the chapter the second part is on climate i don't know of a great analogy for this the weather is what's happening today it's the temperature it's the rainfall it's the wind speed it's the uh what's going to happen tomorrow what happened yesterday last week whatever what climate is is a composite larger weather patterns occurring over numbers of years what has been happening for the last decade what do we predict to happen for the next de decade and you talk about something hard to predict that really is uh, how have things been going over the last century over the last millennia since the last ice age okay you're talking huge periods of time either where from number of years to number of centuries now climate is the determining factor in lots and lots of things one thing the types of plants and animals in a given location okay i don't know 
know about you, if you have been able to notice it in your lifespans, because your lifespan is not nearly as long as mine, but when I was a student in Nebraska, they saw, I, when I was up there, they saw their, it seems like to me I heard reports of the first armadillos ever seen in Nebraska. Armadillos usually occur down in Texas, you know, along the Mexican border in those areas, you know, New Mexico, Arizona. That's where you expect to see armadillos. You didn't expect to see them in Nebraska, and they were beginning to get armadillos. We see armadillos here now. Back when I was a boy child, I don't think we ever heard of an armadillo, okay? They just didn't exist. Uh, types of plants. There are certain tropical fruits, oranges, grapefruit, tangerines, only grow in Florida and areas of California, Hawaii, those kind of areas. We usually can't grow them up here. However, we have, my wife likes to grow lemon trees, so we have three lemon trees, they're small, and one lime tree is small too. And what we do is in the winter time, we roll them into the garage, and in the summertime, they're out. And in the winter time, in a warm day, they're outside. If it's gonna get below freezing that night, they rolled inside, you know. And if it's gonna get super cold, we set up heaters in the garage to keep them alive. Uh, so we kind of cheat a little bit, but the types of plants and animals at a given location, that's determined by climate. Now, just a few more examples. When I was a young boy, yeah, we had ant hills, ant mounds, and I got bit many a time, and that was not pleasant. But we didn't have fire ants. Has anyone ever run into a fire ant mound? Those things are vicious. They are aggressive. They will attack you, okay? And they also, their bite and sting last for days, sometimes weeks. Whereas a regular ant bite, oh, it'll hurt when they first bite, but then you know, in a day or two, you don't even remember where it was. Okay. Um, those are some negative things. We raise on the farm that I grew up in in Georgia. We raise cattle. Okay, beef cattle. And the thing I love seeing the most, but never saw it as a child, was the cattle egrets. Big old white beautifully flying birds and they just hang around the herds because there's always flies and bugs around the cattle and they're just in there feasting away and they walk among the cows cows don't mind them we don't and then they'll pick up and fly and they fly in in flocks and they just are beautiful to watch do it never saw one of those the first probably decade or two of my life just all of a sudden one year they started showing up and they've shown up ever since they aren't there in the winter time, they come from somewhere else. But the the climate has changed enough for fire ants, armadillos, cattle egrets, those kind of things. Now, think also about the types of houses built. Now this is a man type thing, not nature thing, but it's still important. If you look around this campus, and any campus, if you want a Birmingham as well. If you look at all the buildings on this campus, say one or maybe two, every one of them has a flat roof. This one has a flat roof. Most of the buildings have flat roofs. To me, I think that's not a great idea, but definitely it was cheap and it worked. Okay? Now, right across the way there, you can't really see it because of all the trees, there is a building that went through a major renovation years ago, and they put a slanted metal roof on that. Just a new building. Was originally a slanted roof, but now it does have. They were having such leakage problems and stuff, they went on correct that. On the Birmingham campus, the ACAT building has a slanted roof, and I think that's not the only one. Probably that new building that's going up, the uh, Academic Success Center, or whatever they're calling it, I can't recall what it was looking like, but generally it was not. Why can we get away? Okay, do you think up in uh, 
juggle France, say. Do they have any flat roof buildings? Grenoble, France. That's up in the French Alps. Snow. Why? They get a lot of snowfall. And if you get a lot of snowfall, a flat roof will cave in on you. So the more snowfall you get, the steeper your roofs get. And that's why they call those alpine chalets, you know, very, very steep roofs. Okay? Our houses, fairly low slope. Some houses will choose to do a lot of slope. See, the more slope you have, the more shingles you put on. Harder it is to put shingles on it, you know? So the least slope you can get away with, that's you be in. And anywhere there's low snowfall, or basically no snowfall, which is almost us, then you have uh, you don't have to have very much slant to your roofs. Okay, here's Kayla. And just to catch everybody up, I don't know if I've said it when everyone's come in. Remember, we've only got this week and next week of classes left. That means research papers are due this week or next week. After that, you start losing points. And this week is the last week to get that last little bonus point. Next week, zero bonus points. The week after that, negative, non-bonus points. Okay. So, and then two, your labs, your tests. Uh, if you are missing any of those, please get those turned in as well. Okay, so that are things that are influenced by climate. Lifestyles, another thing. Okay, again, it's sort of nature, but it's sort of man. Thing. If you think about it, where are the best hockey teams? Second? Yeah, Canada, okay. Russia, you know, those areas that have snow lots of time in the all year round. Just don't have many good hockey teams down in Florida, do you? Uh, in fact, I think um, UAH is the only school in Alabama that has hockey as a sport, and they may not anymore. You know, it just doesn't happen here. Up in the Midwest, in the northern states, yeah, that's one of the major sports is hockey. Okay? If you've ever wondered, uh, and think about it, where are most of the, I know there are exceptions to this, but most of the football powerhouses, Southeastern Conference, Texas, Florida, California, kids can get out and play all year long. Up north, they can ice skate all year long. They can't play that much football, okay? So lifestyles, okay? Beach goers or mountain climbers, you know, that's all determined by climate. What do climate, what does climate influence? Or well, influence is the shape of the landscape. If you're in an area that did experience some of the glaciation that we talked about, the ice ages, there's a very different and characteristic shape to those landscapes than there are to the tropical areas which never seen a glacier in our lives. Okay. Another, the types of soil. Okay, now there's two parts to climate. Just as there's two parts to weather, important parts. Rainfall and temperature. I've been sort of talking about temperature big time. Rainfall is also important. In areas that have high rainfall, typically your soils are very depleted of nutrients because they get leached out, they get washed out. Also because of lots of rain, plants grow. They use the nutrients, okay? And so after a while, the soil is pretty weathered. Far along in the soil forming process, okay? In very dry areas, okay, the reverse happens. What happens here in the southeast where we get lots of rainfall, the rains come, the nutrients that are in the soil get washed deeper and deeper into the uh, profile, or they get used up by plants. In a very dry area, the moisture transport is upward. Underground water actually comes to the surface because the surface is so stinking dry. 
the water gets evaporated off the surface and that creates the pressure to pull more water up from underneath. So that's actually bringing nutrients to the surface. But it's so hot and dry, nothing can use them. So they actually have salt buildups that <laughs> it gets so salty, nothing will grow. So it's sort of a terrible cycle there. So the types of soil, your more weathered soils are in high temperature, high rainfall. Your least weathered soil are in low temperature, low rainfall, okay, or snowfall or snowpack. And then you've got varying degrees in between those, which also contributes to agricultural type and productivity. The, um, I mentioned we have a bee farm, at least this year we do. Next year, uh, this year we sold one of the smaller herd. Next year we're going to sell the bigger herd. My brothers are getting too old to want to do this much longer. They want to enjoy their retirement. And uh, so next February, March, sometime in there, we're going to sell the bigger herd. And, plant, and we're going to start this year planting pine trees. So the farm is going to look very different. But that, yeah. our cattle that we have, my father always used Hereford cattle which came from somewhere northern England, okay, somewhere in England. And then Angus cows, I think they must have come out of Scotland. Those are big, you know, everybody likes English, English, Angus, Angus beef, you know. And then there's others like Shorthorn that are actually, uh, don't have that many in the area, but Charlet came from France. Uh, but most of these are European varieties. They're not really all that well suited for the southeast. Now they've adapted and they do okay. The ones that do better, say in Texas, are the Brahma, which probably came out of India, where it's pretty hot too, um, and a mix between Shorthorn and I believe uh, Brahma or Santa Gertrudis. Uh, they are big, rangy cattle, um, usually somewhat ill-tempered. Okay, especially the Brahma. They're really ill-tempered. So my father didn't like messing with them. So we got the more docile, uh, cooler weather cattle that weren't really probably best suited for down here. Why does it make a difference? Because those cattle were grown on cool weather grasses like fescue and things like that, as they have in Scotland and England, and they don't make it through a summer in, in the southeast. We have Bermuda grass and, and Bahia grass and the warm weather grasses, which usually don't have the degree of nutrient that the cooler weather does. So you see, all of this is intertwined. Uh, in the Midwest, <laughs> boy, topsoils measured in feet. Rich, beautiful, fantastic topsoil. You can bulldoze it around, still have plenty to grow things. Why? Well, the, the high sages brought many, much of that down from Canada. Uh, they're just not highly weathered because it gets very cold in the wintertime. Uh, the types of plants that grow there are grasses. Grasses have deep, small rooted systems and every winter those roots die, put nutrient back in the soil and then they grow new roots the next year. Uh, whereas here, you know, uh, it, we just don't have that kind of depth of soil. So our agricultural productivity is very different. They can plant their corn rows, really narrow rows, and their soybeans and other things and get enormous harvests. We can't because we have to add fertilizer for every ton of, of uh, product we get off the soil. We al almost always have to add that much fertilizer just to grow it. Otherwise, it wouldn't grow. Up there, oh, they probably do do some fertilization. They just plant and it grows. I mean, it's, so agriculture productivity varies with climate. But what can we do that they can't do? We can double crop. My dad used to do this, not in every field, but in some of his fields, plant in the winter, late fall, early winter, plant the grains, wheat, oats, rice, barley, something like that, and harvest that May, June, and then plant soybeans and harvest that in October and November. He could get two crops out of the field. Whereas in the Midwest, if they had a late spring, they may not make the corn crop that year. 
if it stayed cold too long or wet too long and they couldn't get into the field, they couldn't even, if they didn't get their corn planted by a certain day, might as well not plant it because we're going to hit a frost early that we don't have, you know, and we can grow things much later. So there's pros and cons to all of it, but climate is the, is the major contributor uh, and influencer of those kinds of things. Now, what are some of the major climate issues? Two primary factors, okay? And these are really somewhat related to each other. One is the intensity of the incoming solar radiation. And that's determined by the angle at which that is coming in. Let me get my globe. Now, who's going to be my son this week? Okay. I guess it has to be Cassidy. She's going on here in the middle of the room here. Okay. If this is the globe, that's where we live, you're the sun, the thing that's always closest to you is the equatorial area. Most direct solar radiation coming from you, hitting that dead on. Goes right through the atmosphere. Up here where we live, your rays are coming in, but they're coming in at an angle like this. So they have to go through more atmosphere because they're coming in at an angle and they're losing energy as they come. Okay? So we don't get that intense radiation that they do around the equator. But we get more than they do up north. And poor people up in the Arctic Circle hardly get any at all. All the rays coming in, even in the summertime when they have 24 hours of daylight, it's all coming in at low angle. So there's very low energy. It's coming through a lot of atmosphere before it ever gets. Okay? So the climate is determined. The primary factor is the intensity of this uh, incoming solar radiation, and that's determined largely by the angle at which it's incident. Near the equator, direct. Further north and south of the equator, less direct. Near the poles, very indirect. Okay. Now, second factor, number of daylight hours. On average, we all get the same number of daylight hours. Just at the North Pole, it's 24 hours a day some days, and six months later, zero for so many days. Okay. So, but we all average 12 and 12, right? But, it's very different depending on the time of year. So, uh, right now, we've passed our, our longest days, but still, if you were up in uh, Alberta, Canada, uh, you're probably still going to have sun setting at 9 o'clock at night, okay? Here, it's probably 8 o'clock, isn't it? Or all the close to it, that the sun's going down. You still have enough light to do things very late in the day. Near the equator, 12 and 12 all year long. You okay, are very close to it. Hawaii, my uh, nephew was out there in the Navy, and uh, <clears throat> it's in the tropics, okay, just barely. Tropic of Cancer is just above Hawaii, but maybe even one or two islands that are, are above the Tropic of Cancer. But most of them are below, the major islands are below. So they get, you know, some variation, but not much. They may have 13 hours in the longest hour and only uh, 11 in the, in the dead winter, you know, whatever that is there. So the number of daylight hours also are uh, factors in the, the uh, climate groups. Now, where does that come from? The tilt of the axis. The further you are from the equator or the tropics, the bigger the variation in your daylight hours, winter to summer, summer to winter, okay? Uh, the equatorial regions receive more solar radiation year round. Summer, winter, fall, spring, year round they receive more solar, solar, solar radiation at slower, at more direct angles of intensity. The intensity changes on a yearly basis in other areas. This is a poorly put together slide. Intensity changes on a yearly basis in other areas. The number of daylight hours varies 
and go. Longer days in the summer, shorter days in the winter. Daylight hours. Days are the same length. Daylight hours here. Okay? So that has big influence on the climate groups. Now, another thing is the climate and the latitude. Well, that's sort of the same thing. The low latitudes are in the tropics. That's 0 to 23 and a half, north or south. Those are low numbers, low latitudes. Okay? Climate is very different there than it will be in the temperate or the polar regions. Incredibly different. So the low latitudes are the high solar radiation, more direct radiation, the yearly variation is very small, and the temperatures are uniformly hot. Okay? All year long. Now, Hawaii, if I understood it right, not just from Daniel, but other people who have lived there, uh, it seldom goes to above 80 degrees. Even in the tropics there, seldom over it. A lot of places don't even have air conditioning because they have these nice breezes year-round. Even in the hottest day, maybe 80, 85 or something, the winds don't cool it off pretty quickly at night. Okay? Why? Because they're surrounded by water. Okay? Water is a great air conditioner. Okay? Keeps it cooler in the summer, warmer in the winter. Okay? Temperatures are uniformly high. But in dead winter, seldom gets out of the 70s. Maybe a few nights in the 50s or 60s, and they're freezing then because they usually don't have heat, okay? But they are uh, low latitudes, very little variation. Middle latitude, that's where we live. That's also called the temperate area. That's between the tropics and the circles, the Arctic Circle and the Antarctic. Okay? And there's a huge amount of variation in that, by the way, too. Okay? Uh, in this, you have higher solar radiation during one part of the year, our summertime, lower during the other part, our wintertime. That's the biggest reason for the big changes in temperature. Okay? It's the amount of direct radiation. Okay? Very little, uh, and we don't get any direct, but the we get more direct than the Summer times are less in the winter. Overall temperatures lower with greater variation than the low latitudes. We can easily be quite a bit warmer than the equatorial areas. It just depends on where in the equatorial areas we are. Now, I have a niece, who I, we haven't seen her since she got back, but this past year and for the next two years, they will be living in, and they have been living in Dubai. Okay. I think that's it, but I can't read it. I believe that's it right there. Now, it's not quite in the tropics. It's just above uh, the Tropic of Cancer. Okay? Uh, just above it. But it's pretty hot. Okay? It is on the Arabian Peninsula, which is basically all desert. And they just have sand, 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 sand. Their major weather situations are how much blowing sand is the deck. You know, that's it. I mean, it's just it's awful. It's not that. And the temperatures are hot. Partly because there's not that much moisture. Because moisture tends to moderate the temperatures. So they were 120s, 115, you know, quite often. They're home for the summer, and I bet you they're enjoying being here, even though we're way more humid than they are there. But even then, they're on the Persian Gulf, so they're right next to water, so that can be pretty sticky and humid too, and they just don't get that much rainfall. There seems such a contradiction. It seems like, a, in many ways, an awful place to live, but in other ways, maybe a pretty neat place to live. From what we hear, Eddie, her husband, is loving it there. He loves his work there. Uh, he works at Honeywell, and uh, from what we can tell, Martha is not enjoying it nearly as much. We haven't talked with the kids yet, so we don't know what they think. Okay. So, uh, greater temperature variation than the low latitudes. 
in Minnesota, they can have 93 summer days, and that's pretty miserably hot there, you know. Uh, and they may not get 90 degrees in Hawaii. That's bizarre, okay? But that shows the variation that goes on there. At the high latitudes, this is 66 and a half degrees north, either north or south, depending on which hemisphere you're in. The maximum amount of radiation during one part of the year which is very little and absolutely none in the other part of the year because all of it's coming at very low angles going through a lot of atmosphere and then part of the year you're not getting it. Overall temperature is the lowest and they actually have wider variation than we do. Okay? Of course their variations are to the very low extremes like negative 40 some odd degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit either one and maybe get up to something above freezing, which, guess what? That's an awful huge variation there. If we go from 60 degrees at night to 80 degrees in the day, we think that's extreme. You know, that's chilly at night or cool at night and almost muggy in the daytime. So we very seldom have anything that great. They can go from minus 40 something to positive 15. That's 50, 60 degrees variation. Usually not in a day, but that's that's an extreme variation. Okay? Now, how do we describe this? This is really one of the better uh, graphics I think that they have. Now, they're not showing the tilt of the Earth too well, but they're showing the sunbeams coming in. Okay? On the equator, that's direct hit. So let's just imagine the atmosphere goes out through here somewhere. That's direct hit to that sun comes through much less atmosphere. Now, again, the atmosphere is up here, but it's still down here. This sunlight is having to travel. That's coming directly in. This is having to go a greater distance to hit, and then it hits at an angle, so some of it gets reflected off. This is all dead on, okay? So your low attitude, direct radiation, least variation in temperature summer to winter, middle latitudes, indirect variation. When you're tilted toward the sun, more direct, away from the sun, sun, greater angle, even less radiation. At the high latitudes, no matter what time of year, the angle is steep, the sunlight's gone through a huge amount of atmosphere, losing energy as it went, it hits at an angle, it gets reflected off very easily or deflected off very easily and just very little. And then in the winter year, part of the year, none of it ever hits. That's when you tilt it away from it and you don't get a bit of it. So the Tropic of Cancer, 23 and a half north, Tropic of Capricorn, 23 and a half degrees south, the Arctic Circle, 66.5 degrees north, and the top, uh, uh, Antarctic Circle, they don't show it here, 66 and a half degrees south, making the 23 and a half degrees here in the year two. Everything's based on that 23 and a half degrees. Now, the middle latitudes cover probably the greatest span here, so there's the greatest variation there, but um, it's, uh, the tropics have a lot just because the Earth is bigger around. Equator, of course, is at zero degrees. Now, this creates what they call the climate zones. What do we mean by that? These are defined in terms of yearly temperature averages. Okay? Yearly temperature averages. Now, even though it may get hotter in the summertime here than it will in uh, Ecuador, okay? It gets much colder in the winter time and still not very cold down there. So the yearly average temperature is going to be much warmer there than here, even though the hottest time we may actually be hotter. So the tropical climate zone, again, same as we've talked about before, these are the ones near the equator, we see the most solar radiation, it's hot. Okay? And Lawrence here. So, that's your tropical climate zone. 
anywhere near the equator, between the tropics, 23 and a half degrees north, 23 and a half degrees south. See, we're seeing almost the same thing on all the slides, whether we're talking about climate zones, climate you know, influencers, or whatever, they're all here. Now, they're jumping up to the other extreme, the polar zones, the least solar radiation. They're cold, I mean just cold, year-round cold. Much colder in the winter, but year-round cold, okay? Constant daylight part of the summer, constant darkness part of the winter. That has to be brutal. It's so frigidly cold outside, you never see any sun, nothing's there to warm you up. That's, I, I guess I could handle it, but I don't think I'd want to handle it, okay? And here's Christy. What is it, 130? A couple of you have come in since I said this last, so let me say it again. A couple of issues. Number one, we have this week, we have next week with classes. And I'm not absolutely certain, but I believe finals start on Tuesday, two weeks from today. Is that right? Are any of you in classes that are around the finals yet? It seems like to me that's when finals begin Tuesday, and that's the... Uh, 31st of July, is it? Is it Wednesday the 31st? And then finals go to the 1st and the 2nd. So it's Wednesday and Thursday. I think that's all. All we have for finals. So we can have ours either on Tuesday or Thursday. You can choose which one you want. Yeah, I thought y'all would want that. Uh, it actually works better for me, too, I think. Uh, but that means we have class today and Thursday, next Tuesday and Thursday. And that's all, folks. All of class for the summer. Okay, we will have final exam on the following Tuesday, so we'll meet again. But your papers, research papers, are due during class day. That means you have three more class days to turn them in. You can turn them in in between class days, but that means this week, next week. That's all, folks. This week, turn them in this week, you still get that one last bonus point that's out there. Next week, zero bonus points. You just get your score. Finals week, you start losing points. Okay, negative, non-bonus points. So get those in sooner rather than later. Also, I return, I know, first lab, first test, second test, and fourth test or something like that. Because I've gotten them all in. All the rest of them, I'm missing one, two, up to five or six. Some labs, like the moon lab, most of you haven't turned that in. Three of them have turned that in. So we need all those coming in this week and next week as well. Okay? Try to get caught up sooner rather than later. Um, now, has anyone seen anything about student course evaluations? I haven't, but I don't know if they ever do them in the summertime. I can't recall that they do. But if you do see anything about it, please get them done. Please. But I don't think they, they do those in the summer. I wish they did. Uh, but anyway, get that done. Now let's talk about more practical things in the class. We're getting close to finishing chapter 23. The lab for 23 was supposed to be, and I hope it is supposed to be, and will be, hopefully, the trip to Channel 13 Weather Center. And, and, uh, I tried calling yesterday and left it. I got a lady who took me his office, but then got voicemail there. So I left him as a mail message. He's, he's, he's hosted us many times before, so he knows what's going on. Uh, and I told him when I'd be in the office yesterday, but I wouldn't be in the office today, and I will be in the office again tomorrow. I didn't hear from him yesterday, I was in the office way later than what I told him. So I, he did get back to me yesterday. I planned to call him back, but I got a really complicated email that took quite a bit of time to first research and then answer and respond and come up with a solution for it. So I was almost an hour late leaving here last night, so I didn't get to call it back. So hopefully we'll get to make the trip to the Weather Center possibly as early as Thursday, day after tomorrow, Thursday. If not, it's going to have to be Tuesday or Thursday of next week. Those are our only shots. Okay? So hopefully we will be. Uh, if 
the only time you can step was to choose to the final three, would you be willing to do it that week to get away? Or even the Thursday final three, after you've had our final three, you'll do it. But, uh, okay. uh, well, I told them this week or next week. Okay, I didn't go in the final three times. Okay. Now, as it is, we're kind of in pretty good shape. If we do go to the Weather Center, that's going to be almost the whole day. Maybe not the whole day, but most of it. We drive over there, be there an hour to two hours, and then drive back. That's going to be most of the day. Um, however, we may have time for a little bit. So that leaves us today to finish this chapter. The lab for this chapter will be one of those three days if we get to do it. The test will be the last 30 minutes of one of the days we're not there, okay? And then we have chapter 24 to go, which I think we can pretty much knock out in one day, have the lab and the test the next day. So we might not take two. But it looks like we're going to have some time to spare. And if we do, that's a good time for you to make up tests and make up labs if you're missed, okay? So that's the advertisement. The other thing... Today is voting day. This is the primary runoffs, and there's there's candidates out there on both parties that the elections are today. Please vote before seven o'clock this evening. I've got to go to the Birmingham campus and teach class till five thirty. Be on campus till after six. I'm headed straight to the voting hall of the station, and I have to do some work at home. Please vote. If you voted in the primary, you have to vote for the same runoff. If you didn't vote in the primary, you can vote for either of the runoffs. Not both. So please vote. Don't pass up an opportunity to vote ever. As I was saying earlier, you lose the right to vote, in my mind, if you don't vote. And most people don't. I don't know why, but do not. The primary election barely get 25 percent eligible voting rate in either primary. Yeah, I think it's just really pathetic. And now the runoffs are probably going to be less. And every if they tell you the vote doesn't count. Yes it does. See these small elections more so than ever before. So please vote. And Cassidy says she wasn't old enough to vote yet, but she's on term 18 on Sunday. She can register and still vote. So please, if you're not registered, get registered so you can vote in November. Okay, so back to this. Polar uh, climate zone, least solar radiation, cold, constant daylight, we talked about that. The temperate climate zones in between the tropics and the polar, that's where we live, intermediate between the others. Now, in this little thing at the bottom, rainfall pattern shifts seasonally. Okay, that's pretty vague, isn't it? And the reason it's vague, <laughs> there's no, there's not really a lot of rhyme or reason to it. Okay, does anyone know what our driest month of the year is? Traditionally, historically, here in Alabama, what's our driest month of the year? Make a guess. Second. October. October, you said. Right on the money. How did you think that? Most of the time we don't think of October being dry because it's not hot. Plants are, you know, sort of born into dormancy, so they're not, you know, thirsting to death. We usually think the summer months are the driest months. Well, not this July anyway. We're having to rain almost every day, okay? Uh, this is a very good year. And my brothers, I know the, the farmer, said, why didn't we buy something this year? Well, he's trying to cut down, not increase. So rainfall pattern shifts seasonally. There are some areas of the world that really have only two seasons. Not winter and summer, not spring and fall. They have two seasons, wet and dry. Okay. Um, I have a good friend of mine is a missionary in Cameroon, near the equator equatorial part of Africa. There's Cameroon right there, just above the equator, well south of the Tropic of uh, uh, Cancer. 
And they all talked about summer and winter fall and spring. They talked about wet season costs. And oh, it's so dusty, we can't wait for the rain. And then, oh, we can't wait to see hot weather, you know, so everything's moldy, muddy, gets stuck, you know. It just is either rain and it varies a shift season, okay? Uh, friends from India talk about monsoons, you know, monsoonal weather, it's either raining or it's dry, okay? So we are so fortunate, we have fairly even rainfall year round. So that doesn't seem to fit with this. So that's the other side of climate. Temperatures and rainfall. Okay. So let's look at some of the um, divisions. Now this slide is going to il is illustrating something that's going to come up in a later slide. In one later slide that's going to come up, it shows a split as being very abrupt. This shows there aren't any abrupt lines. They sort of vary and change. These are kind of the tropical region. Sometimes they're above the, the uh, tropics or below the tropics. Other times they're within the tropics. That's the tropical band. Okay? The temperate bands are up here and there. Okay? And then the polar bands there. Now this makes the polar bands seem way bigger than they really are. Remember this is a flat graph of a globe. Really this is a very small area down here and a very small area up there. But because they spread it out, it looks a lot bigger than it is. Northern Alaska, Northern Canada, uh, all of Greenland, Iceland, Northern Scandinavia, Siberia, the northern part of Siberia, that's all polar. All of Antarctica pretty much is polar. The very tip of South America. I'm trying to remember. <coughs> I think that's Cape Horn is at the bottom of South Africa. There's Cape of Good Hope and Cape Horn. I, I always get confused with the two. I think that's Cape of Good Hope and this is Cape Horn. They say that's some of the roughest weather on the planet. Because you're in between the polar and temperate. Uh, the winds are high, the, the, they're cold, they're blowing from the south, they're frigidly cold. If they're coming from other directions, they can rain. It can be, and they say this is, this is death on shipping. I mean, it's really, really rough to get through these areas down here. You either have to get all the way around and try to weave your way through, and the winds and the things, and visibility is awful. And, uh, uh, that's why I want to call this Cape of Good Hope, but I think that's Cape Horn. Anyway, so that's your, uh, your regions. So it's not merely defined by the tropic or the Antarctic or Arctic Circle. Okay? So it's in a broader world. Okay? Now, still not saying anything about rainfall here, but still temperature. This is the one that says about rainfall. This is the, almost ridiculous, okay? This is just showing. Uh, typically very wet. Typically is real close to the equator. Typically. Now, is there a big shift like this and it's, it's wet here and, and dry there? No, it's, it's more like the other one. Wavy lines and stuff like that. This is, to me, not a good track. Okay. And then you have dry regions, you have the very wet, dry, and then wet again. Okay? And we're so fortunate we live in the wet region for pretty temperate temperatures. Okay? Um, and just about all the US is in that. Okay? Um, Canada, cold, okay, icy, snowy. That's the very cold up here. Okay, Mexico, dry, okay, uh, very wet in the equatorial part of northern South America, but very dry in this part. Wet again down here, but it's getting pretty cold if you go down here. We're just so fortunate to see good rainfall, good temperatures, good just about everything. And it's not our fault, we just lucked into it, okay? Some people might say 
we deserve it, but I don't think we do. Okay? We're just fortunate. All right. Now let's go to regional climatic influences. Okay? Oh, and the book has some really great pictures. Uh, one picture, figure 23, 21, showing huge computer rooms, the supercomputers that are running the models for the uh, weather forecast. Uh, they show lemons growing, what types of plants or animals depend on your climate. Um, a broad variety of plant life and growth in a tropical climate. Here are a tropical plant, orange blossom, red flower is just beautiful. But then polar climates occur at high elevations as well as in high latitudes. Um, this is a polar type climate. You can see uh, snow in the background, yet the herds of elk, I believe it is, uh, seem to be thriving there. Um, temperature climate and deciduous forest responds to seasonal changes. Uh, the autumn shows of colors. I don't know if this is in New England or somewhere there, beautiful area there. Okay, so that's leading into regional climatic influences. Okay. Forty till two. Remind me at two thirty. I think you call roll. So four major factors in regional climate influence. One is altitude. That's what I was just talking about. You can have some polar-like conditions near the equator. If you're up in Mount Kilimanjaro, way high elevation, it can be almost polar up there. Not quite, but it goes pretty close to it. Um, and the uh, this thing. Tallest mountains in the world, Himalayas, right there they are. And where are they? In the lower portion of the temperate region. There's a tropic of cancer right there, and within just a few miles you're in the Himalayas. You're definitely not in a tropical or subtropical area. You're in a polar type area way up there. Nothing grows, it's frigid up there, so that's because of the altitude. The higher the altitude, the air radiates more energy back into space, okay? The more, the, the thicker the atmosphere is, so the lower altitudes, then the heat gets trapped. Deeper and deeper it goes, has very little chance to get back out. At high altitudes, especially where there's snowpack, snowfall, then it reflects back really easily the, the energy is lost in space. Okay? So that altitude, that has to do with mountains. Cooler air at the higher altitudes. Now here is a key little phrase here that you need to really think seriously about. Okay? And I think somewhere in the book they phrase it differently, but this is the best way to phrase it. The cooler air is at higher altitudes. That's because higher altitude radiate more energy back into space. But, here's the other side, side of that. Now, let me also mention this. Probably it was talked about in chapter the skip. But generally, because the Earth turns in that direction, okay, that means the, the globe, the Earth, the water, the land, everything is turning like this. The atmosphere that's above it sort of sends the same where it is, so when the earth is turning like this, it makes the wind seem like it's going in that direction. But actually what it is, the earth's turning under the wind. So on the equatorial areas, the wind is usually easterly. And that's why the hurricanes come off the coast of Africa and come across like this. They're being pushed by the prevailing easterly winds of the tropics. Okay? Then when they get up here, they get blown by the westerlies. Now, why are the winds blowing to the west here? Because you see, as the earth turns this way, it drags the wind with it, so the winds start picking up velocity in that direction. Near the equator, it still feels like it's going this way, because the winds are being drugged this way. Up here, where the earth's not turning as fast, that gives us our prevailing westerlies. That's why most of our winds, Come from the west. 
most of the storm system come from the west. It's not everything blows in the temperate regions, blows west to east. In the tropics, east to west. Who knows why it's doing up north? I mean, in the polar regions, it's just swirling and just mixing up like crazy. Okay? So we get most of our weather this way. Now, every now and then we get systems coming up from the Gulf, so we get winds from the south. They're usually hot, humid winds. Okay? That sort of patterns we were talking about earlier. Okay? Um, so that's. So let's get back to, to this. In, since most of our winds come from the west, the upwind slopes coming off the ocean, they get the moisture. So the Cascades, the Sierra Nevadas, the Rockies, most of the moisture is trapped on the west side because that's where it's coming, off the ocean. On the east side, then there's less precipitation. That's the dry side. The better way of saying this is how they say it here. The upwind slopes, you see more precipitation. The downwind slopes, less so. If you think about the several things going on there, the moisture's coming in. As it goes up, it's cooling off, precipitates out, either it's rain or snow. By the time it gets to the top, it's reached its coldest point. As it comes down, it's warming up, Increasing its or decreasing its relative humidity, increasing the capacity to hold more moisture, so it's not going to rain on the downwind slopes. So that's the best way to express that one. Um, I think in the book somewhere else it says western and eastern. The better answer is upwind and downwind slopes. Okay. So let's continue. Okay, take it back. Altitude and mountains, they go hand in hand. Four major factors for regional climatic influences. The next is large bodies of water. Okay? Now, the largest body of water is, of course, the Pacific Ocean. And that influences all of our West Coast, big time. It influences Africa, Alaska, big time. Of course, it influences Hawaii that's surrounded by the Pacific Ocean. So that's large body of water. Okay, but even things like the Great Lakes. Have any of you lived in the Great Lake area? Okay, they have in the winter time some snowfall up there. They call lake effect snow. It's moisture coming off of the Great Lakes that is making the snow. It's not a weather system off the Pacific, Atlantic, or anywhere else. It's off the Great Lakes. So, of course, your bigger bodies of water like Hudson Bay and the Mediterranean and other areas. And for us, the good old Gulf of Mexico. Because guess what, team? If we were counting on Pacific Ocean to provide the moisture for us, which is where the direction of the wind's coming, we'd be parched dry by the time we got to it. But we have the good old hot Gulf of Mexico here that sends the moisture up to us. And we benefit big time. The Atlantic some, but you see the winds are predominantly going this way. But in the Gulf of Mexico, we still get an easterly flow from the tropics, and that goes north and keeps us nice and wet. Thank you very much. Okay, so large bodies of water. The high specific heat of water moderates the temperature changes. Now, think about this. Have any of you gone to the beach in the summertime? Okay, have you noticed when you're driving down, it's pretty hot when you leave here, usually in the summertime, right? Getting down toward Montgomery, it just seems sweltering hot to me. And then you keep on going south, it just gets hotter and hotter, Enterprise, whatever route you're going there, just seems like it gets hotter and hotter until suddenly you reach the beach and it seems like it cools off, doesn't it? And the reason is the water has high specific heat it takes more energy from the air to heat the water temperature than it does land. Land has a specific heat of about 0.2, water has a specific heat of 1. Five times the specific heat of land. Okay? So therefore, the more moisture, the more it moderates. Then in the wintertime, have you gone to the beach in the wintertime? Most people don't. But it's cold up here, 
and you get down there and it's much less cold. Okay. Well, sometimes you get at a bad time, it can be pretty bad there too. But water moderate. And that's why Hawaii stays around 70 to 80 degrees year round. It's surrounded by water, warm, bathtub water, it never changes. Now, large bodies of water, and this seems like it's connected to it, certainly is, ocean currents. And we'll talk about these next chapter as well, big time. Because these can bring water nearby that has very different temperatures from the land. And here we again we benefit big time. Because on the eastern coast of the US, there is a current of water, ocean currents, that comes from the Gulf of Mexico and goes up our eastern seaboard. And it goes all the way up here. It actually goes over and hits England, Ireland, and the United Kingdom. Okay? Look how far north they are. Okay? Over here in Canada, at the same elevation, at the same altitude, I mean, the same latitude, they're frigid. They're cold. They're, the harbors freeze up. Okay? In England and Ireland and Scotland, they don't. Or maybe some in Scotland, way, way north. But they don't because the Gulf Stream is always bringing in nice warm water up to the side here, which of course keeps our entire eastern seaboard nice and balmy and pleasant. We have good beaches on Long Island, on New Jersey, even some in Massachusetts. I don't know how great they are in Maine, but there's some nice beach areas all along our eastern seaboard. You go out west, here the currents come down and split. Some go north and actually warm up the Gulf of Alaska, but some go south taking cool water all down here. If you go swimming, and they don't have much of a beach in San Diego, I mean, they have a nice beach in San Diego, but it's not really like the Atlantic beaches. If you go swimming there, most of the time you're wearing wetsuits. Even though they're way far south, because you've got these cool air and water currents coming this way. Gulf of Mexico keeps all of our eastern ports open to ice year round. Not so in Canada, they get iced over. But fortunately, Great Britain does. That's why she could be queen of the ocean. Even though she's way far north, her ports never close. Now, poor old Russia, though I know that some people don't think they're all that poor. Uh, most of their ports are frozen. All right. Frozen in the. Uh, Wintertime. I mean, ice soak ships can't get in and out, okay? So they don't have good trade in those areas. Look on the eastern side, they really don't have much of a port, okay? They do have one area, and I don't think I can see it here, where they actually do, they took over some land in here somewhere just so they could have a port. That's why. Crimea suddenly became very important to them. They wanted a port on the Black Sea. Okay, in Ukraine, oh, no, the Pentecost scholar. Okay, uh, that's why they took Crimea back. Even though they have some ports on the Black Sea, that was a better port. That's what a lot of the political discussion was about recently. They needed a warm water port. Port they can get to year round. That's what they use. All right. Let me make sure I get Justin Mark. You are now Mark, Justin. Okay. Okay. All right. Dismissing Ed, Chris, Lee, or Adam. That's all. Good attendance. All right, so ocean currents can make a big difference to climate, regional climate conditions. Equal areas, equal latitudes can have very, very different climates just because of ocean currents. We'll back to that later. Next chapter, big time. All right, here shows a couple of these, and this is what I was talking about. 
The northern equatorial current brings warm water from near the equator, and this is in the tropics, into the Caribbean Sea here, into the Gulf of Mexico, and really the Gulf of Mexico is one hot bathtub. Okay, it's, it's nice warm water all year round pretty much. And then from there comes the Gulf Stream that keeps all of our ports free of ice all year long. For Canada though, the Labrador, Labrador current brings cold water down, freezing many of their ports. Whereas the Gulf Stream is on out of sea, ice warm. So you talk about some big temperature changes that happen in there. There really are some. Now this, and this is not what it's talking about now, this also made some of this area here some of the best fishing anywhere on the globe until we overfished it like crazy. That was the Sargasso Sea, I think they called it. Used to be where every fleet in the world went to fish. Now there's hardly anything there because we overfished like crazy. Okay? And the type of which we overfished was very bad too. Here on the west coast, like I was describing, you have the California current coming in, which moves down, so it's cool water moving down this way, keeping Southern California unseasonably cool. I mean, there is San Diego right about the same level as, what, Savannah, Georgia? Savannah, Georgia, you can go to New Jersey, you can go to the beach and get a sunburn, you know, because it's so warm. San Diego, you wear a wetsuit. Okay, it's just kind of crazy. But then the other northern Pacific current, which is warm compared to the water up here, that keeps much of this portion. There's uh, Seattle and Portland and, and uh, Vancouver, Canada, uh, Victoria Island, all this stays ice free all year. Even though it's way north, you know? Over here, frozen. Over here, ice free because the North Pacific current is warm enough to keep it ice free all year. In fact, the Aleutian Islands, even all this part of the southern part of Alaska here. You know, Alaska. This is a lousy representation, but it, it stretches down. Our 50th state took up a lot of Canada's coastline here. Uh, Juneau is actually the capital is on that little strip that goes down here. Really looks like the tip of Canada, but there we have it because it's ice for year round. Whereas over here, further south, they're frozen. Frozen in here, quite often. Of we'll talk about those more next time. All right, so how do we describe, 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 describe climates? Okay, here are the problems. Some of the pictures here show angles like this. There aren't any angles like that. There are no sharp boundaries. And in fact, there's no two places on the globe that have the same climate. They may be close, they may be similar, but there's no two places have exactly the same climate. Something will be different. Temperature, radiation, rainfall, something. Now here's a description of the North American climate zones. That's what we're going to do next. And that's the picture on page 593. Pretty incredible picture. Um, and I'll show the picture at the same time. This is much smaller scale than you have in the book. So it's well worth a look. So let's look first at the marine climates. These are near the oceans. And look at this. All along the Pacific Coast. Part of this is Canada, part of it is Alaska, part of it is you know, U.S. Poor old Mexico doesn't get any of it. But that's your marine climate. Mexico does get it over here on the Yucatan Peninsula. That's probably one of the wettest nicest for a lot of the uh, Calhoun, a lot of the places people go to vacation, that's the nice, the beautiful part of Mexico. I've never been there until I first raised in Uh Well, it's hard to tell the difference. This, I think, is marine. This is all <laughs> tropical wet. Almost the same thing. Okay. Now, marine climate near the ocean, influenced by the air masses from the ocean. That's why they don't include this as marine climate, because the air masses are coming from the continental part here, blowing to the ocean, not blowing from the ocean. These are blowing from the ocean, 
Remember where they sweat? These are in sweat products. Okay. Then we have the continental climate. These are far from the ocean. This would be in here, and up here, you know, far from the ocean. Influenced mostly by air masses from large land areas. Okay. And then you have other classifications. Arid, the very dry, semi-arid, not quite, humid, very wet. So let's look at some of these. I can't read them all, so you might need to help me out here. Of course, we have the poles. That's the northern fringe of, of, of Alaska, of Canada. Look way down south here in the Bering Sea. Uh, it's pretty cold for much of that. That's, and there's, there's Greenland there, Iceland over here. Uh, polar. I mean, just really, really, really cold. The surprising thing is Iceland, even though it's way up north and very cold, tells you two things. The Gulf Stream still hits up that way, and also volcanic activity keeps it. They can keep a little bit warm. Okay. Then we have, they just say, humid continental. And I can't read that next word. What is that? Humid continental. Subarctic. Okay. Um, it's pretty wet, but it's also so cold. They don't, you know, good grasses grow and that kind of stuff. You can have decent agriculture, but very short growing seasons. Humid continental mid latitudes. That's this part here. And that's basically our Great Lakes. Um, this is a uh, Goes from sort of Pennsylvania, uh, New York, Ohio. Well, Ohio's a little bit more down here, but goes up into Canada. It's humid mid latitude. Humid continental again, but this is low latitudes. I wouldn't count this all that low latitude. It's still fairly high at that. But this, where we live, humid subtropical. Tropics are down here, and very tip of Florida tends to be counted as tropic, but this is subtropical. So that includes even probably Washington, D.C., some of Ohio, and some of those areas here. Fairly humid subtropical. Plenty of moisture. Thank you, Gulf of Maine, for that first coming from. Uh, and my <coughs> one here. Tropical wet, that was this little area here. Uh, tropical the green. Tropical with seasonal wet dry. Okay. Uh, down here. Cuba. Uh, this is the uh, this is all over with the Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Uh, Puerto Rico. Is it right here or Yeah, Puerto Rico is right on top of that. Okay, this is tropical with seasonal wet, dry region. And you would think this would be wet almost year round, but it's not. This is where the monsoons come in, the wet, dry. See, much of Central America is like that. Cuba, Hispanola, Puerto Rico, I don't think they caught that island over there. Oh, that's Jamaica. Uh, that's your uh, tropical, but seasonally wet and dry. This is tropical wet, by all means. Semi arid, that's here. Okay? Fortunately, a lot of Mexico is that, but that's up to the southwest, uh, and it goes all the way up here. Why is that semi arid, where this is tropical? I mean, this is humid. Seems like a big break there. Well, this is where the air coming off the Pacific Ocean loses its moisture on the upwind side and it's dry on the downwind side. It hasn't picked up the Gulf of Mexico because that gets pushed up, up like that. So this is dry. This is our Great Plains. Okay? They're not super wet. Uh, they have adequate moisture, but it's just uh, sitting there. These are your deserts. Okay? Much of Mexico is desert. 
this to me is the strangest thing. Here is the what they call the Yucatan of the Bible, Baja Peninsula. It's surrounded by water. Pacific Ocean here, Gulf of California there, three sides of it completely surrounded by water, and it's a desert. And you think, why would that be true? Well, go to Africa. Okay, go to um, the Persian Gulf. Water pretty much around it, but it's totally barren. Here is our uh, Mojave Desert in here. Very, very dry. Marine, that was just from over here. The Mediterranean, that's unusual. It's more like the Mediterranean climate. Uh, it's sort of just enough for you to do well, but not so wet that you know it, it gets fungally you know, wet. Uh, that's where grapes grow well. Okay, if you think about Italy, France, the Mediterranean countries, the wine countries. This is the Napa Valley and the San Joaquin Valley. They grow all sorts of crops there. So that's Mediterranean. And then you have the highlands. These are your mountains. These are the Sierra Nevadas here, the Cascades here, the Rocky Mountains there. I don't know what the name of those mountains are if they have a name. Um, I'm sure they do, but I don't see them on here. Um, but those are highlands. And guess what's happening here, folks? The water coming in here from the Gulf, that's why this is wet area, uh, tropical season with wet dry. It's the upslope, the rain falls, the downslope, it gets drier on the other side. Same thing here. Okay. The islands are basically the mountains. The things that block the moisture from getting further in. Those are the major climate zones. Now, we also have local climates, okay? Now they have a little thing, example 23.3, is sort of fun to do. The following table is the monthly temperature data and total monthly precipitation for a location in North America, which major climate zone would be in this location. It gets quite cold, so it's nothing here in the southeast. Uh, the precipitation is very low in the coldest parts of the year, a bit higher, but not huge millimeters they're measuring. So it's not a huge amount, but that's in the summary part of the years. This would have to be some of that maybe semi-arid or something like that, and I'd say pretty far north like into Canada. Let's see what they say. Um, It's a polar climate, actually. I was putting it much lower than that. They show another table where the temperature is never uh, below freezing, or the average temperature isn't. Precipitation is incredibly high. That would be a humid, humid subtropical, a lot like what we live. So now local climates. This is on page 594. Okay. Wait a minute. I was supposed to have called roll already once now. Sorry about that. I was thinking 2.30. It was 2 o'clock I was supposed to call roll. Let me get that mark. Ed didn't make it in today. Tyus is still here. Cassidy had to leave. Did she leave before 2? I think she did. Huh? No, it wasn't right at 2. I probably should have marked it. Okay. Jessica's still here. Christy's still here. Chris didn't make it in today. Uh, Guy's still here. Kayla's still here. Adam didn't make it in today. Justin's still here. Jordan's still here. Lauren's still here. And Jacory's still here. Thanks for hanging around, folks. Okay. You want to take a quick five to ten minute break? Okay. Uh, we don't have a huge amount to go, but we do have some. Uh, so let's pause this earlier. All right, local climates. Sometimes these are called microclimates. That's a local pattern within 
a climate area. And sometimes it can be very different from what the surrounding is. Now, one of these is associated with large cities. I think I've talked about this one before, the heat island or heat dome effect. And I, did I describe my trip home in the winter time here? Okay, quite often in the winter, uh, I'll have a very late class, usually one of these classes, this was science 111 or 12, usually 112. And I can go out to the car in the parking lot, and when I start to, you know, start it off, it'll have a certain temperature there on the dash. And I'll leave here and go out, get on the interstate, probably not, not much change. But as I begin to leave Bessemer, it starts cooling off. And I thought, well, that's normal because it's a little later at night and I'm going a little bit north. I'm also going a little bit east. And so the sun's been down a little bit longer there. Not much. It's not going to make a huge dip. But the temperature goes down a little bit. And then when I get, <clears throat> say, through the Fairfield area, uh, and start getting into Inslee, the temperature starts going up again. Well, I'm still going north, I'm still going east, I'm still later at night, so you would think the temperature would be dropping, it starts increasing. And it keeps increasing. When I get into Birmingham, it's usually five degrees warmer than it was when I left the parking lot here. Even though it's later at night, a little bit further north, a little bit further east, everything would think it would be cooler and it's warmer. And that's just about every night, okay? That's because the heat island or heat dome effect. Buildings and pavement absorb more and then emit more solar radiation differently than natural vegetation and landscape, okay? What are those trees doing right out there? Okay, it's not much. But what I mean, they're absorbing radiation from the sun and they're making carbohydrates, okay? They get carbon dioxide from the air, water from the soil, up through the roots, and the combination of carbon dioxide and water makes a carbohydrate, a sugar, a simple sugar, okay? And they store that in the leaves, they store it in the roots, they put it in their seeds, their plants, whatever, you know, the plant parts, um, and <clears throat> that can absorb energy, okay? Whereas a building, it may warm up the bricks in the day and then emit heat at night. It's not saving anything, it's not doing anything. So yeah, they're gonna be very different from natural vegetation and landscape, especially black asphalt. Oh my goodness, that gets hot. People you know, sometimes say it's hot enough to fry an egg. It really doesn't get that hot, but it gets hot. If you've ever walked barefooted on black asphalt in the summertime, you burned your foot, I almost guarantee you, because it is incredibly hot. And then that all re-radiates back. So yeah, you get that heat island, heat dome effect. And then think about this. Okay, here we are in here. What is it? Probably 80 some outside, and maybe 90. Okay, now what are we doing? We're pulling the outside air in. Somewhere in our air conditioning systems here, we're pulling that heat out of the air and blowing it back out there. So every bit of air conditioning is taking heat out of the air that's in the building, blowing it back outside. So that's getting hotter. We're cooler in here, but it's getting hotter outside. And they're not very efficient, so it's doing more and more of that. So yeah, all over the place. And then we have our cars. We have our machinery. We have our, um, you know, everything going on in the building. Even lights produce heat. Everything produces heat, okay? And that's going on in a city more than it is out in the countryside. Now, these local climates can even be associated, say, with a single tree. Uh, any of you Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, uh, any of that kind of stuff, okay? Did they teach you about how to find your way in the woods and stuff like that? Is that more Boy Scout stuff? No, they tried. Okay, they tried, okay. Basically, you can almost tell the direction north, south, east, west by looking at the mosses and the lichens that grow on the trees. Uh, now in different environments it might be a little bit different, but usually the cooler uh, side you'll have more stuff growing on that than on the direct side, but then the green stuff will grow a bit more on the southern side because you get more sunlight there, 
So you have a variation going on there around the tree. A very side. More things will grow on one side, not on the other. Okay? And part of that might be because of drought conditions, it might be because of the light, it might be because of moisture, lots of other things. Yeah, a single tree can have various microclimates. Now, <clears throat> I told you I think about um, Muir Woods out in California where the giant sequoias were growing. I love that place. I mean, it's just incredible. And they said that those trees are so tall, they can go from being very cold at the top to very warm and moist at the bottom. And there's clouds actually somewhere up the trees. There's that tall that you find clouds in some parts of it. You know, it's just, it's, it's incredible stuff. So, yeah, local climates can have lots of variation uh, in a very small area. Now they're going to talk about climate change. This is 23.4. And frankly, I kind of don't care too much for this author's attitude on it. Okay, He seems to kind of poo-poo it somewhat. And uh, I think he's not taking it as seriously as it really is. But I don't know. I don't know him personally. Climate change is a departure from the expected average pattern of climate for a region of time. Now, that's a rather strange thing. Time, you don't think that's region, but I know what he's talking about. Now, here's the rub. We've only been educated enough, technologically sophisticated enough, to have really taken good climate data, well, as shows here, from maybe the 1600s or so, and this was probably pretty spotty there, 1800s or so, it's getting a lot better. Now this isn't measuring how good we do, but this, back here, uh, nothing! We weren't co collecting data, we were barely surviving then. Those were the Middle Ages, those were the Dark Ages, you know. People weren't studying the climate, they were just trying to live one day to another, okay? Many parts of the world, people still have to live that way. They don't have time or energy or, or resources to do it. So back in these time, times, you have to have what they call proxy data, used to infer past climate conditions. I'll give you a few examples of that. They have done extensive core sampling of some of the really deep ice areas. They could be glacial areas or just places like the poles where there's very thick ice. And they can take cores down there and as long as they can estimate how far back in time those cores are, they usually get further back in time the deeper you go. And by going back in time that way, <clears throat> they can determine what some of the past climate conditions were like. like what kind of animals were trapped in the ice? What kind of spores? What type of, uh, what the oxygen level trapped in the air in there was? What the carbon uh, footprint was there? I mean, lots of things they can do. It's not very precise, but it can give them some information that they have a pretty good guess of what was happening back here when nobody had thermometers, okay? No one was measuring rainfall. No one was doing any of that. But they have determined that there was a very cold period somewhere back here. Now, this is all A.D. That was since the birth of Christ. Basically, fairly modern times. If you're going back to ice ages, that would be several rooms down the hall. I mean, that's a long, long, long time ago. We don't have much of anything there. Okay? So from some of those cores maybe, but it's really spotty. So we are not sure we even have one complete pattern, but it does seem to be there's generally warming trends, generally cooling trends, and then warming trends again. Now, this may be a little sub picture of a bigger picture, who knows, okay? Uh, but it says, according to proxy data, Earth has experienced a period of warming and a period of cooling over the past 1,000 years. And how long have we been around? A 
60 billion years. So 1,000 years is that much in the history. Okay. Now, what is concerning scientists today is basically this right here. Okay. Continues on here. This only shows you 2,000. It continues. Even among the stuff they estimate and other things here, there has never been a time when they, that we can tell that the slope was that steep or that long. Okay. Yes, that's what we're talking about. Okay. And what has happened since the 1800s to 2000? What has really occurred big time since then? Second. Okay. It got hotter, but what has been happening on the Earth? What have we been doing? Yeah, we've been industrialization, right? 1800s, most people lived out in the farms, you know. They subsisted living, you know, they raised food. That was about most of, that took most of the people doing it. What do we do now? Industrialization, industrialization, industrialization. Burning coal, burn. everybody has electricity. They didn't have it back then. Everybody has, you know, all sorts of things. We're energy hogs right now, okay? Automobiles, airplanes, trains, everything. Back then, of course, the buggy, okay? That was transportation back then. Sailing ships, you know, or, or you know, coal fire ships. But, you know, things have changed so much. We're putting way more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that the greenhouse gas and our temperatures have shot up unbelievably high for such a short period of time. Sure, we've had warmer times before, but never have we had the change in such a short period that steep of a change that we've been able to determine. How long do you think Earth will last? Earth will probably last for another five billion years or so. Okay? Whether life on Earth will last that long probably doubtful. Okay. We are liable to screw things up really badly. Okay. But we might fix some things too. I don't know. Uh, now they're going to look at a shorter time. This is from 1900 to 2000. So this band here basically is this to that. Okay. It's a very narrow band uh, and that's going to be the whole picture here, so they've really expanded this out, and uh, so they expanded the X scale, but kept the Y scale pretty close to what it was, wasn't it? No, that goes from minus one to one. This is going from uh, minus point four to plus point four point five, something like that. So the data about the ice ages and interglacial warming show that periods of warming and cooling occur in really long cycles, way longer than a hundred years or a thousand years or two thousand. I mean, we're talking about uh, hundreds of thousands of years, large cycles. During the past 100 years, which this is showing here, Earth has experienced, it says, two warming cycles. Here was one, and there was one. Okay? The whole time in between was the uh, 40s and 50s there. And it wasn't super cold then, it was just a little bit of a dip there. Okay? Uh, temperature changes are not uniform, obviously, not in all places. They say temperature in the southeastern U.S. has cooled since the 1970s. I'm not, that would be since here, that if we have cooled, I, I don't think this is up to current. Maybe this was between 1970s and 90s or something like that, but I think when you get out here, uh -uh, we're not cooling, okay? Uh, sea ice in Antarctica has increased, they say, but that, I think, again, was back when this slide was made. Since then, I think I've heard of great big chunks of ice falling off into the ocean and melting. So I don't know that this is really still accurate. Okay? It may have been for a few years it did, but then I think things have changed. This is a warming trend that's hard to say, no, that's not really happening. Who knows? 
it is really happening. Okay? Now, the argument is, is this part of a natural cycle? We haven't been collecting data long enough to know, okay? Or is this indeed something we've contributed to? I think the data are there to say we may not be having a huge impact, but we are definitely having an impact, okay? So, here he talks about the causes of global climate change. The result of complex interaction of factors without a doubt. Okay? It's not a simple answer. Not a simple thing. One of these is sunspots. Okay? Now, I don't know that there's any reason to think that the sunspots are any different from what they've been in the past. The principle of uniformity tells us that things are the way they are now because that's how they were in the past. And the things in the future will be because they're the same as here. So I don't think that the sunspots have changed that much. They may periodically go through some changes, and that will affect our climate. The Earth's tilt it hasn't really changed that much in, in much of the time. The orbital shape, I don't think so. Yeah, it changed. I mean, it varies every year, within a year, but it doesn't. The axis wobble is incredibly slow. Remember we said that to... 2,700 years to make one cycle, but then it repeats itself. So I don't think that's going to be a major contributor. Yes, those are factors that do contribute, but not big time. The greenhouse gases, water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, and other trace gases. Okay? Now, this probably hasn't changed much. Carbon dioxide, that's the big one. And methane, that's the big one. They do influence. Now, admittedly, they're very small parts of the atmosphere, but they're small parts that would, a major change in them would make a major difference. Now, here's one that I agree with completely. Tropical deforestation. Now, this influences in so many ways. If you look at the tropics, tropical areas on the globe, especially in South America, that's between here and here, those are the tropics. Huge portions of Brazil, the vast majority of Brazil is in that window, okay? Uh, huge portions of tropical forests here, okay? Other countries do, Colombia, Venezuela, uh, Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, uh, also in that land, the parts of Paraguay and that, okay? Yeah. Especially in Brazil, I hate to pick up Brazil, but it's kind of true. They don't have much natural oil, so they were energy dependent on everybody. And they didn't have a super strong economy, it's okay, it's a good economy, you look pretty good, but they were spending so much on oil to modernize. So they decided, let's grow our own oil. Plant soybeans, maybe corn, other things that big oil producing crops. We got to have land for that. So what they did, they had really dense, thick, tropical rainforests here. They started leveling. Now, they probably harvested some wood, some of the hardwoods, beautiful woods like the mahoganies and other things like this. They probably had plenty of that. They probably saturated the market with it, so they didn't have anything else. So they just bulldozed them up in piles and burned them. So, what are they doing? This carbon that the trees have been gathering, pulling carbon dioxide out of the air, making these carbohydrates that make the fats and the oils that make cellulose, it's, it's the crops, the stems, the leaves, uh, all that kind of stuff. All this has been stored in these tropical rainforests for millennia, for centuries anyway. Okay? All this carbon there, all of it's made out of carbon, and they burn it. 
because that carbon goes up from carbon dioxide. Lots of carbon dioxide. Okay? Those tropical rainforests before those plants, that thickest, densest population of trees and plants in general, and they were pulling carbon dioxide out of the air and releasing oxygen. That's our biggest source of oxygen on the planet, is our tropical rainforest. And we're sawing them down, digging them up, burning them, and now not taking carbon dioxide out of the air, but putting carbon dioxide into the air. Okay, you go over here to Africa. Now they're not doing as much of that there, uh, just because a lot of Africa is uh, still somewhat under, well, in the northern part here is desert, okay? Uh, but down here, there's just not that industrialization and, and that big a move. But people are still, the population's growing, so they cut down trees to burn their, uh, to cook their food, to do everything else. So many areas here are being deforested. Slower than back here, but still being deforested. We have other friends that are missionaries in uh, Madagascar. Okay, and much of that mostly in the tropics here, and they have cut down just about all the available trees there. They're losing their soil, it's washing off the mountains because they cut down the trees just to cook their food. Okay, I don't need it for heating that much, but I need it for cooking. So he's a forester, and he's been encouraging replanting the trees, especially fruit trees and things that the people can eat this pot about. It's been a hard struggle. Okay. Now let's get to Indonesia, okay? Does anyone have a food product in here? I see some chips. What are the ingredients in that? No, the chips. chips. Didn't you have some? You have some too. Yeah. What are your ingredients? Vegetable oil. Say again? Vegetable oil. Vegetable oil? Rice oil. Rice flour. Okay, right. Okay, so it didn't have palm kernel oil. Okay, thank goodness. Okay, look at many of your foods, many of your foods, and you'll see the oil that's in it is palm kernel oil. Because it's really rapid growing. And what they've been doing in Indonesia and other areas in here, and look at that swath here. They've been cutting down tropical rainforests planting palm kernel oil plants, whatever they are, palms, and they are not taking as much carbon dioxide out of the air and producing, but they're producing these oils. And these oils are the sort of the worst oils we could drink to eat, you know, uh, mostly eat, uh, because they don't digest well. But they're cheap to produce, okay? And they've been taking down tropical rainforests these palm kernel oil, soybean oil, corn oil, just burning with the thing, a tropical rainforest for disappearing. They are the biggest producers of oxygen and removers of carbon dioxide, and they're taking them out, burning them, sending the carbon dioxide back into the air. That's a problem. Methane, we're somewhat responsible for this. Uh, we are eating more beef and pork and chicken and all that kind of stuff. If you've ever driven by a feeder lot, which I doubt if you have because they're mostly in the Midwest, but how about chicken farms or pig farms? What's that? <laughs> My wife said if you worked at KFC, you would be too. <laughs> Uh, she did when she was in high school. But those places produce a lot of very bad smelling gases, but included with that is lots of methane. That's going up pretty fast too. And everywhere that we are drilling, for oil or other things, methane comes out. Every place we're fracking, and that's what's making us big energy producers now, methane comes out. So we are really releasing lots of this into our atmosphere as well. And the tropical deforestation. So we're going both ways. We're releasing more of those, 
getting rid of the places that remove those. Not a good combination. So, again, this guy's attitude, I really don't care for that much. He talks about just bullet points here. Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, established by the United Nations in 1988. Not that long ago. Maybe before some of you were born, but not that long ago. Despite research, data, and models, the predictions of the experts vary. Okay? Now, this is an old slide, but still, even when this was done, here's how they vary. This preponderance of evidence say yes, there's major climate change. These over here say, no, I don't think that's really true. Yes, there's a lot of variation here, but the preponderance of the evidence, of the data, and of the experts are saying yes. Yeah. And in fact, more so since this was the slide was produced. In fact, it's a very small, almost fringe group that are saying, no, 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 we're not too sure about this, okay? And I'm not sure where this guy falls. I'm afraid he's in the fringe. I'm not sure. This is a nice-sounding statement. Critical analysis of climate change should be completed before future policies about human-made carbon dioxide are implemented. That sounds like a fairly reasonable statement, doesn't it? Uh, do you think you're ever going to completely analyze? I don't think so. But you can get a whole lot of data suggesting this. But if you want to wait till it's completed before you do anything, you may be too late before you do something. Here's a kind of a dumb illustration, but I think it's still an appropriate. I grew up on a farm, and we had a big garden every year, and we raised cucumbers, and my mom always put up peppers. And she had this big old, I think it was a three-gallon uh, glass jar that she put the brine and the other stuff in to make her pickles, okay? Just let them sit there for days or weeks on the end, you know, to absorb the salt or the whatever they were absorbing, okay? So a big glass, I want you to picture a big glass, three gallon jar. Now let's say we filled that jar with the absolute perfect, perfect growing material uh, for bacteria, okay? All right, now let's say we put a single bacterium in that. You tell me, just any, pick any time period that you would like to say, before that bacterium is going to split and make two bacteria. Name a time. Hours, days, years, weeks, months, I don't care. Name a time. Say again. A week. Is that what I heard? A week before it's going to split. Okay, it's a really slow growth, but that's okay. All right, so it's going to split. Uh, it's going to take a while, but every week that splits. So the first week, then there's two, next week four, next week eight, next week 16, next week. Okay, let me do a little side thing here. And this was supposedly a true story. I don't know if it really was. There was an Indian mathematician who developed the game of chess. Y'all familiar with chess? I don't play it much, but I know how to play it, but I'm not very good at it. Chess, it's a checkerboard. Eight faces this way, eight this way. So a total of 64 squares on the, on the checkerboard, okay, and the chess. And, uh, but boy, it was, when it came out, it was really popular. Some really rich, powerful Maharaja in India just fell in love with the game. He said, who invented this game? This is the greatest thing I've ever seen. I want to know who this guy was. Well, they researched and found out it's this little mathematician living somewhere over here, on my way, they said, bring him to me. I want to reward this guy. This is the best game. I've ever seen him in my life. So he yeah, had the guy brought in. And he said, well, I'm not going to do it. I don't really tell you about it. He said, well, I'm just about to do it. He said, it's so kind of you to treat me this way. He said, no, 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 no. I want to reward you. I want you to say anything up to half my kingdom, and I'll give it to you because this is a fantastic really. So that's what he had to do over his head. So he said, no, no, just, just the fact that you like it is enough for me to 
No, I want you to name something. And both both mathematicians said, okay, let's put a single grain of rice on this first square. And then every square after that doubles the number of grains of rice. Okay? So there was one grain, two grains, four grains, eight grains, ten grains. And by the time you got to the first row, probably just a little over 100 grains of rice. Okay? And then Kept on going. Before he got, and, uh, and, the, and the Maharaja said, No, 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 no. I want you to ask for something big, something major, something. This is just grains of wheat, grains of rice, it's nothing. He said, No, 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 this will be enough. Well, before you got halfway up the board, he would have, he would have emptied every granary he had. And before he got to the end of the board, it has been more grains of rice than has ever been grown on this planet from the beginning of time. Well, the Maharaja was made cool, so he cut off the guy's head. So I don't know, I don't know what the ball of the story <laughs> was. But that's what we call exponential growth. Okay. So the same way technology set up with the TCIP. Second. Technology set up kind of way with yeah. the TCIP. Yeah. So technology is up on the Uh-huh. Nice. <laughs> okay. So let's get back to the pickle jar. So that bacterium is doubling every week. Okay? Well, you name some period of time when that jar is going to be full. How long do you think it's going to Just make up the thing. If that was a week, it may be months or years. Name it. Second? Two years. In two years, the jar will be absolutely full of bacteria. When will the jar be half full? Second? A year. Half a month. Okay. The jar will be half full. One year, 11 months, and three weeks. Or the number doubles every week. It will be half full the week before. So that's how fast change happens. So if you wait until all the data, complete analysis, critical analysis should be completed before future policies uh, are implemented, you may be way too late. That week will be gone in no time, okay? By the time you wait for this, the policies won't have any effect at all, or it'll be, what's the old saying? Too little, too late. And I think today, with all the new data we've gotten since this was published, even more so. Okay. Yeah. You can't wait to do something until you're sure you've completed all your analysis. No. The preponderance of data say we've got a real big problem on our hands. We need to start making changes. I'm sorry. My little soapbox. I'll get off of it. Okay. That's the end of the chapter okay uh, the picture of the sunspots is on page 596 there's some times of year when they increase and decrease over an 11 year cycle uh, they're indicators that the sun is more active and emitting more energy than when you don't see the sunspots okay um, they have the other things there. there's a little blurb here and this is really worth a read. El Nino, have you heard of that? It's a time, and you'll have to read this to, to do. It's, a, it's one of the biggest weather makers we have, okay? It's a little area of the Pacific Ocean off the coast of South America, probably not far from the Galapagos Islands here, somewhere over here that they measure the temperature, and sometimes it's really, really hot compared to other times. At other times it gets cool. And I think it's times when it's really hot, you know there's going to be some pretty major weather patterns happening, unusual weather patterns for the next year or two. Maybe extra rainfall here, extra drought there, higher temperatures here, or, yeah, it makes a big difference. And it usually happens around Christmas time 
is when they do they notice that because that's near the tropics it's not going to make a lot of difference there and el nino means the child the christ child at christmas time okay now the alternate times when the temperatures are lower that's la nina okay and that's just the opposite of el nino okay well worth the read because you hear the weathermen talk about this. Well, we're entering an El Nino. We think it's going to be pretty strong this year. Or eh, it's in a La Nina and uh, uh, not sure it's going to have any influence. Yeah, you hear them talking about it. Well worth the read. Do that. The person behind the science this time is Wilhelm Furman Corin Bergerkness or something like that. Never heard of the guy in my life. But evidently, he, he was a Norwegian scientist, created modern meteorology. Uh, so it was quite an impressive dude. Okay? Now, I want to do something here that didn't put a slide on here. Here is the carbon dioxide concentrations uh, since 1860. 1860 here, that was Civil War. Okay? 18, 1900, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And then it took off and grew big time up to 2010. Look at that steep slope. Look at that steep slope. And you impose that on, that's 1970 to 1990. That's here to there. Look at the temperatures. When the carbon dioxide was going like that, look at the temperature. And you say there's no correlation. There is major correlation there, and we keep producing. This is what it used to be about 290 parts per, uh, parts per billion. Okay, that's not that sound like a lot. We're now up to more than 400 parts per billion. That's pretty major, people. Even though it's a small number, it still seems to be having a radical change. Okay. So I don't see how he said, no, let's do complete all the analyses before critical. Okay, whatever. All right, the summary here. Okay, you know what I'm going to say. Nothing replaces reading the chapter. Please read the chapter. Maybe a time or two. There's a pretty good summary at the end, but it doesn't cover everything. Key terms, a fair number of those. They're listed alphabetically, but the page number are listed. And then applying the concepts... Um, probably a few, fewer, not too many fewer than normal, only 45. I think the best thing to study for your test would be that. Uh, questions for thought, 14, maybe a few fewer than normal. Further analysis about normal, about four. Uh, then there's some parallel exercises there that you might find interesting. I don't think they're all that, but some of them are really well thought out, so you decide. Okay? Now, how are we doing? Oh my goodness, it's after three, isn't it? Okay, some of you are wanting to take a test. Do you think you can do it in the next 30 minutes? Okay. Why don't, anyone who wants to take a test or work on a, a uh, lab or something like that, great time to do so. And if you want to make up a test, come tell me which test it is and I will give it to you. I'll turn that off in just a minute. You want the last test? The what? Yeah, the next. The last one. Um, yeah, I think we did. Did you do topographic maps? Probably not. Okay. Here's test seven. Anyone else need test seven? Okay. I think you're still missing test two, aren't you? Huh? Okay. Do you want test seven also? Mm -hmm. And Lauren, did you want to need test seven? Is that what you want to do? Okay. Is this last week? Last week. Okay. Now, did some of you want the last lab? You were asking about it. I mean, yeah. Okay. Um, Corey, did you need the last lab too? Okay. Uh, Lauren, did you hand this to Corey too? Okay, I meant to be through before 3 o'clock. I'm sorry I went so long.